Good morning, everybody, and welcome to, today, to today's webinar. Today, we will be discussing how to build a high-performing team. My name is Patrick Allen, and I'm the Program Manager for Kent State's Center for Corporate and Professional Development's Public Open Enrollment Programs. Our center specializes in providing employee development for partnering organizations in Northeast Ohio and around the country. We offer training as public open enrollment programs delivered in Independence, Ohio, and also on-site customized programs delivered at your location. I am joined today by Kent State Facilitator Ned Parks. I will be serving as your host, and Ned will be our presenter for today. Ned pulls from a wealth of experience to deliver upbeat and highly interactive programs. His dedication to the individual and each of us is driven by his own life's journey, one that is filled with change, adventure, learning, and spiritual discovery. During his time in the U.S. Army, Ned not only flew hel helicopters over South Korea, he, he was also a classroom and flight line instructor. Upon his return from the military, Ned founded his own company, where he realized that there is more to building a company than just seeking profit. He nurtured his associate's strength, walked the talk of respect, and demonstrated that leadership is mental, not positional. Ned also held the position of a division general manager for a local manufacturing company, where within one year, he turned the struggling, lackluster division into a highly profitable group, restoring employee morale and reduce, reducing turnover. For Kent State, Ned facilitates both public and contract training programs for organizations in both the public and private sector. Ned harnesses his passion for helping others by conducting humor-filled leadership and motivational keynote speeches and workshops on the challenges of everyday life. He also encourages each person to examine their potential goals, values, and beliefs to determine their areas of strength and opportunity. Everyone in attendance has been muted to avoid any background noise from any of the nearly 200 registered participants. We do encourage you to ask questions at any point during the hour. You can submit your questions in writing using the control panel on the right side of your screen. I will present your questions to Ned as time per permits throughout the webinar. There is also a handout available to you under the Handouts tab. Please download and print this handout as Ned will be referring to it during his presentation. We are recording today's webinar and you will receive an email with a link to the recording after we conclude our time together. With further ado, without further ado, I would like to introduce Ned Parks. Thank you, Patrick. I appreciate it and welcome everyone that's here. It's um, great to have you. Uh, we're going to start with a, a quick little exercise just on your own. If you grab a piece of paper or if you're sitting with someone, certainly do it with them. Just brainstorm some, some items that are barriers to a high-performing team. What are some of those things that become uh, barriers to high-performing teams? So take about, oh, 30 seconds and go ahead and do that. Okay, after running this program literally hundreds of times over the years, I've got a, a quite a theme of answers, so we'll we'll have a little fun with this. And Patrick, would you put the poll up for us? And we'll take a little poll and see how how some of your answers that you have where you are uh, uh, compare with some of the polling answers we're going to have here in just a minute. You just go ahead and answer those polling questions. We'll see what you have. We'll see what the whole group brought back. About a 10 second, seconds more, about five seconds more, and we'll close the poll and see what everybody came up with. All right, here we go. Okay, so communication came out top, which is very, very typical. Engaged team members came out very high. And then we had just a couple uh, for time and a few for money. And I'm sure that your uh, 
your uh, results that you have in front of you uh, have a lot more things on here than that. Communication always tends to be pretty high up, as well as engaged team members are pretty high up. Some of the others that we get uh, fairly often um, in this are things like uh, laziness, people not holding up their end of the bargain, uh, all the work falling on one person, uh, lack of trust is another big one that happens, can, uh, and we hear a lot. Uh, we hear things like uh, lack of tools, I don't have the tools to do my job, so on and so forth. So as we think about those, I want you to think about which of those items would be interior or internal barriers and which would be external barriers. And what I mean by internal and external barriers is the following. An internal barrier is a barrier that we have some influence or control over. In other words, let's say it's uh, personality differences. Well, I can't change a personality, but I certainly can sit down with someone and, and you know, have that conversation with them and say, you know, we seem to be getting on each other's nerves a lot. Let's work through this. That is an influence step. I, I can take some action. Okay, so what's external? External barriers are those, those things we can only react to. And believe it or not, there's not very many of them. Um, actually, weather would be one. If the weather uh, turns nasty and we can't get the shipment out, then all we can do is respond to that. That doesn't mean we're a low-performing team because we did or did not respond well to an external uh, a barrier. It may mean that we could do better, we could think uh, ahead, but those are what I call tactical and strategic things, not necessarily performance things. So when I talk about a high-performing team, I talk about teams that really uh, – have the following four main characters to them. They're a team that has a lot of trust. They're a team that is filled with purpose. They have engagement with the employees, which you already called out, and they're accountable. Uh, and they're accountable to themselves and to each other. So as you see, I have a question, in which area is your team well-grounded, in which area needs work? I can promise you that the most high-performing team in the world as is better in one of these areas than another, and they need some work. The difference that makes them a high-performing team is they continually work on it. They don't ever let it stop. So we're going to talk about uh, these four items uh, for a little bit today and, and try to get you a, a, a better understanding of what they are and some of the things that you can do that will help you increase each of those within your team. Now, uh, I, I want you to put your head in a different space as you listen to this today. I don't want you to have your head in the space of, well, I'm not the leader of the team, so therefore I don't have any impact on these. Um, I would tell you, I would disagree with you massively if that's where you are. Uh, you are a member of the team, so therefore you do have an impact on it. You might not be able to lead it like the leader would, but that doesn't mean that you're not a leader and you don't have uh, influence and impact on these four items within your team. You absolutely do. So I want you to, to, to regardless of your position on the team, I want you to, to really understand that you have an impact. So another little exercise I want you to, to go through right now, uh, and we're going to take maybe 20 seconds, 30 seconds to give you a chance to do this. You're at an out-of-town family picnic. A long lost cousin says, hey, where do you work? And you tell them, I work here or I work there. And they say, what's so great about the organization you work for? So take about 30 seconds and just write down some of those items that, uh, that you come up with that's so great. I'll give you about 30 seconds to do that. And about five or six more seconds. And again, I've been running this exercise with lots of groups a lot. So I'm going to put up on the board some really common answers I tend to hear. And uh, I'm hoping that some of you will see some of these answers as well. Hey, we have great benefits where we work. You know, we've got, you know, paid vacation. We have paid time off. We have 
sick days, we have a good health plan, we have a good retirement, whatever, whatever makes up all those benefits. There's opportunities here, and opportunities are interesting because opportunities always mean something different to different people. So an opportunity to you might be there's an opportunity for my job to grow laterally. I, le I can learn more about my job. An opportunity to somebody else could be I have an opportunity to move up. Uh, that I can get a promotion, I can go higher up the ladder. So opportunities are are defined differently by different people, um, and I don't really care how you define it. I'm I hope that it's on your list that where you work, that you have opportunities to to move forward and get better. The business feels like a family, or our department. We kind of treat each other like family here. You know, we we get together after work, we have good time, we uh, we we care for each other. If somebody's having a rough go of it. We stand in and support them. We're, we're kind of like a family here. I hear that a lot. We have great products. It's amazing to me and, and always uh, it, encouraging to me when people are proud of the product or service that their company puts out. Um, I love it when I hear, you know, hey, we're innovative. We have new products. Our products are um, on the market. People respect our products. They, they think highly of them. People take pride in that. And, and, and that is great when I hear that that's a, a great product or a great service if you're a service organization. We have a good reputation. You'll hear that a lot. We have good people that work here. You know, I like the people. We have a high diversity. Um, we have sharp people that come into work. We, we demand a lot out of them, and they give us a lot, and they're good to work around. Location's great. Uh, location's awesome. Now, keep in mind that sometimes on uh, – Sometimes on uh, location, one person, it's great because they drive four minutes to work. Another person drives an hour. So they wouldn't put that on their list, but some of the people would. Um, you know, and there's, there's others that, that I don't have up here, free parking and, and, you know, all kinds of other opportunities. There's one you're hearing a lot now with a new generation coming into work is there's a lot of opportunity for us to be philanthropic. We have a day of caring. We can volunteer. We, we do things where we raise money or raise, you know, collect food for the food bank or those sorts of things. And I hear those a lot as well. And, and you may, you may have some of those on your list. Um, so uh, this is a really important question to ask. Yeah, excuse me, Ned. We did have a question come in um, that is wanting to know what is the benefit of asking this question? It's actually a great question. It really is. Um, and here's what I find. I find that, um, you know, if I don't remind myself and my team and we don't remind each other that we really have a great place to work, we begin to, do, A, take it uh, for van advantage. Uh, those folks that work with us that have never worked anywhere else don't have a perspective. And so they kind of don't know that it's a good place to work, that those are good things to have around because they've never worked in a toxic place or a place that didn't have all or some of those. Um, and here's the other one, and this is a little more subtle, I think. Why would I want to work on the difficult things, the communication problems, the personality issues, the employee that's not holding their end of the bargain? Those are tough things to work on. Why would I want to work on that if I don't remember what I'm fighting for? And I think that's a very subtle yet very important piece. So one of the gifts I want to give you today, and I, I do this in the workshop as well, is I want to uh, share with you about running this exercise with your team. And I don't care if you have a team of six people. Here's how you run it. At a staff meeting, you're going to take maybe eight to 12 minutes to do it live. We did it a little quicker here uh, because there's less dialogue going on. But I normally will run it in an eight to 12 minute time frame. So you, you have the time to do it. And when I do it with really small groups, I, the setup is you're at an out-of-town family picket picnic and blah, blah, blah. You have the setup right here. And what I'll do is I'll break my group of six into three groups of two, and I'll have them work together. Uh, there's a really uh, important reason for that. Uh, you'll get first a, a much richer list, and people want to hear, oh, our two, we came up with this. Oh, you came up with that too, and so did you over there. And that is really important, and you won't get to see the power of that if you have the whole group of six do it all at one time together. So uh, you can do it very quickly. And the thing that's powerful about this is it just opens up a nice discussion of, you know, sometimes it is hard to work here. Sometimes we do have some challenges. It's, it's a tough day. You know, so-and-so was mad. We didn't get this done. We had this issue. We had that issue on and on. 
And it's good just to reground ourselves and remember what we're fighting for. And I will uh, have them flip chart it. So I can put that flip chart up in the break room or in my office or in the office environment where they can just kind of passively look at it for the next couple of weeks. And it just kind of reminds us that we do have some good things going on here and they are worth fighting for. So I think it's a, a an excellent question. I'm glad it was asked. And and to me, it's it's incredibly important. I love to do it when I'm at a client's and then I leave it behind for the for our point of contact. And they kind of say, wow, this was like a little mini um, – uh, engagement survey. In a way, it is. I mean, it's just a, a very short focus group, and it's just kind of good to, to remember those things. The other thing that I would tell you is the reason I think it's important that you do it with your team and have them write it down. You could give them your list. They won't believe it because it's not their data. When they do it, it is their data. They believe it, they buy into it, and it's what they want. So, all right, we're going to talk about commitment, engagement, purpose, and trust. So, what are we talking about when we talk about engagement and commitment? And I use the words interchangeably. So uh, engagement, obviously, is a word we use in business about employee engagement, engagement surveys, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's no question about that. But so, uh, I think commitment is also a, another word that's important, and it means the same thing. So here's basically um, uh, th the definition. People are engaged. They come to work. They do their job and they look to do the extra or they look to do it a little better or they look for the opportunity or when they see the opportunity, they share the opportunity. So I had a, a trucking company that was a client of mine over in Pennsylvania and they worked really hard at trying to measure engagement. And it was kind of hard because their drivers are out all day and they don't see them. So it's not that uh, that kind of a work next to you team environment. It's more interacting with the dispatchers and the mechanics back in the shop. So one of the things that they did is they set up a process where the drivers would uh, uh, have an opportunity to report back to dispatch about interactions that they had with their clients. And they looked to see how many did that. And the more that did it, the higher their engagement score. And they actually put that metric out. Um, they rewarded it. And they had all kinds of opportunities come their way. They found extra business, other ways they could service their client, um, those sorts of things. Uh, there's no shortage of, of information out there about disengaged employees. Um, there's all kinds of surveys that have been done. Gallup is probably the leading uh, research company that puts out information on, on engagement. I would encourage you to look up their, they do an engagement survey every year. It's uh, about 400 pages long. Uh, it's quite a read, but I would encourage you to get it and scan through it. It's usually out on the net. I think they just released it a couple months ago for the, the latest version. But um, the bottom line is they, according to their research, um, and this could be terrifying to you, and I hope it is because I want you to take note, they say that we're around 70% disengaged employees in the workplace. So seven out of 10 are actively disengaged or disengaged at some level. And what can we do to engage them? Well, here's some small things we can do. Um, first off is as a leader, whether you're the boss or a coworker, you're still a leader, uh, be open to a, an approachable. Let people come talk to you. Make sure you engage and listen to them. Don't cut them off. Uh, and, and take action with what they tell you. Uh, it, it depends what the action is, but take action. That's one. The other is push uh, decision-making as far down the ladder as you can. One of my favorite, favorite, favorite business books is uh, titled It's Not About the Coffee by Howard Behar, B-E-H-A-R. If you're a, a business book reader, you're going to love this one. It's probably 180, 200 pages, so it's not a not a difficult and not a very long read. Uh, and he just tells the story of how they built Starbucks and how they engage their employees and they have engagement scores that are off the charts. And he's got a chapter in the book that I love and it kind of sums up this entire conversation. And the name of the chapter, the title of the chapter is the guy who buys or sweeps the floor should buy the broom. And I, I just love that concept. Um, it can be taken both literal and figuratively. So on the literal side, you know, if if it's a purchase of less than, I don't know, $100, I'll pick an arbitrary number, um, hand the catalog to the employee and say, buy whatever you want. What, what You need the tool. You're the one that uses it. 
you pick it out. If it gets above that and we have to start thinking about budgets and things, fine. But I still want their engagement on it. I want them to point. I want them to talk about it. I want them to, to have some piece of it. I was running a leadership book club and I had a CEO of a mid-sized hospital in the group and, and we were using this book and he he wanted to to challenge and we I love that in book clubs that challenging a thought or a concept or an idea. And he challenged this chapter and he challenged it this way. He said he said, Dad, he goes, that that's this doesn't make any sense to me. He goes, I'm not gonna hand a two million dollar blank check to a, a radiology tech so they can go buy an MRI. I said, Of course you're not. That would be that would be you know, uh, completely irresponsible to do that. However, I would certainly have that radiology tech in on the selection process. I would have that radiology tech in on the meeting with the salesman from whoever's selling you that, that machine. And here's why. I'll bet that that radiology check tech knows a lot more about putting a patient on or off that machine than you do, the salesman, or anybody else. I'll bet they know a lot more about the bells and whistles that maybe you don't need to spend money on. I, I would certainly engage them in that decision making. Ultimately, the end of the day, the decision is yours. That I'm not talking about abdicating that responsibility. But what we are saying is he's the person that's working with the patient. He should have, he or she should have input and, and engagement on the purchase of that MRI or how it's placed in the room or, or those sorts of things. So just kind of remember that when it comes to engagement, the person that sweeps the floor should, should buy the broom. The other thing that you might think about is having engagement teams. You can call them whatever you want. You can call them business roundtables, engagement teams, engagement groups, committees. And I've seen them around every topic you can imagine. Safety is, is a great one. Uh, facility maintenance is one. Um, you can have it around quality, production, uh, scheduling, uh, employee morale, uh, just on and on and on, what, whatever you want. But the idea is that people voluntarily sign up for these. They come, they have a word, and they make a difference in the company. Now, if you're going to do these, you've got to listen and you have to enact some of the things that they bring you. Um, the more the merrier, and you'll uh, improve engagement all the way up and down the line. Communication and communicating with people is another uh, way to keep them engaged. The worst thing you can do is um, not tell them what's going on. You'll find disengagement happen at an unbelievable rate. Uh, Ned, I did have a question come in. Um, if They want to know if you could um, kind of go back and um, – mention again what you suggested reading other than it's not about the coffee it's oh the, the the name of the book is it's not about the coffee by howard bihar the other thing that i recommended you try to find and it's it's out on the web i i find it all the time is the engagement survey results from the gallup organization um, you'll find it out there. They release it every year. Uh, it's one of those things where you sign up. And you you sign up. You, you'll wind up on their email list. Of course, you can opt out later. Uh, but then they will send you the the downloaded version. I I have mine in the office. And I I want to say that it came out, Patrick, um, in the fall. I think they they le release it just before Christmas, if I'm not not mistaken. I always I always get it every year and I and I I use it throughout the year. There's always something new that I learn when I pick it up and scan it. Clearly at 600 pages you're not going to sit down and read this cover to cover um unless you are suffering deeply from uh uh insomnia, but um it is a great piece of information. So, um that's it for engagement. Let me move on to the next piece of the topic here purpose. Now, <laughs> this is huge for me. Many of you will see this and say, is that the same as mission statement? And I will tell you, no, it's not. I'm, I, if we had time, I would go on and on and on about how pathetic mission statements are. I won't do that. Um, so I've seen some that have been phenomenal. So here's the thing with purpose. This pyramid ought to look very, very um, f familiar to anyone that took, oh, I don't know, high school psychology class. It's it's uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And here's how it connects to engagement. These are where these things start to connect with each other. If employees do not understand the purpose of their task, what are we trying to accomplish? Which 
for the most part, per, mission statements can get you there if they're really well written. Most of them are not, so they don't do the job. If they don't understand what we're trying to accomplish here, it's going to be really, really difficult to get them into the highly engaged area, not to mention just understanding purpose at any level. So you can look at this. If you have employees that are at the survival level, um, physical, um, food, shelter, um, medical care, if if I have employees that are struggling to meet, make that happen, it's very difficult to get them up the engaged ladder. Um, and, and believe it or not, we do have a full-time employees with full-time benefits that are in food deserts, that are on food stamps, that are struggling to make ends meet every single day of the week. And it's very difficult to get them engaged and to think that they're a part of what's going on. Here's one of the things that we can do. Now, you, you, you may not have the option of just arbitrarily changing somebody's pay or a group of people's pay. That, that, that economically might not work for you. So I don't want you to go there right away. I do want you to understand that you may very well have some employees that are that are in that boat. Uh, so a couple of things I will tell you. Um, number one, do you have an employee assistance plan? If you do, then don't just have it and be passive about it. I always believe that if you have one, you should be extremely active about it and you should get it out to people and let them know it's there. This could help satisfy some of those survival issues that they're dealing with um, or security issues that they're dealing with. And maybe not physical security with a locked door. I don't mean it that way. But sometimes, you know, if I have a spouse or a family member that's struggling with with some personal issue, that can put us down in that area from a from a Maslow need standpoint. And the minute I do, I'm focused on that. I'm not focused on my work when I'm there. So what am I? I'm disengaged. I might not be disengaged because I don't like you or I don't like my job. I may be disengaged because I'm I'm distracted. Disengagement can come from that. So you need to scan the horizon of your employees and find out where they are. All right, let's say, hey, Ned, we, you know, we, we don't really have entry level employees here. Our people all make a, you know, fine living wage. We, we probably don't have any issues. You, you might not. You might not. That might not be an issue. However, we do have to look up, up the ladder a little farther. So let me give you an example uh, that I pulled from a Harvard, Harvard business case study that I thought was really interesting. Large insurance company. A benefits department of about 15 people in the benefits department. Uh, these were the folks that after the claims adjuster does their job, uh, these folks fill out forms and ultimately cut checks and send them to um, the claimant. So that's where they are in the in the insurance chain, if you will, or the insurance journey. Um, so they're kind of the last person that touches anything right before the claimant gets their check in the mail. So um, here's here's what we have. We have a group that was of very low morale. They were um, really not working well together. They were not a high uh, functioning, a high performing team at all. New manager came in, started working with them, and uh, finally, after some work, and and uh, somebody uh, said to him, or the group said to him, uh, "We're just the benefits department. All we do is fill out." Uh, forms and cut checks. And I will tell you, let me separate from the story just for a second. I will tell you that whenever I hear an employee say, I or we are just, I stop them dead in their tracks. That is to me one of the dirtiest four letter words out there. Because the minute that I say, I am just the mechanic, I am just the receptionist, I am just the nurse, I've heard I've heard people, and I'm, I'm just an attorney. I've heard every walk of life say it. What they're really saying is, is that I'm less than, and I'm not as worthy as someone else. And therefore, we begin to lose the idea that we bring value to the workplace. And when I don't think that I bring value to the workplace, I don't connect with the purpose. When I don't connect with the purpose, it's very difficult to be engaged in the workplace. So you see how all these things connect together. So back to the story. They said, we're just the benefits department, all we do is fill out forms and cut checks. Uh, he came back to them and said, the benefits department is not about filling out forms and cutting checks. It's about helping people when they're sick and they're in trouble and their house is burnt or their car is damaged or whatever. He then went and got them pictures from 
their customers with their check in front of their crashed car or something with a thank you note. And he began to put it up. And what happened, and, I, and this can be in any group anywhere, people need ultimately to connect the task that they do day to day, which let's face, let's face it, can be sometimes boring and dull and meaningless, and connect it with what it ultimately accomplishes. What does it ultimately accomplish? Um, had a company, a client that was making uh, uh, cement trucks, and they sell them all over the country. Uh, they went and wanted to make that connection so they would have their customers, many of them small mom and pop construction or concrete companies all over the country, take a picture of the brand new truck with all their employees standing in front of it, in front of their building. They would send it back in, blow it up and put it up in the factory. Those employees were able to connect the truck that they worked on with somebody being able to make a living off of it. That was their that became their purpose. I'm no longer building a concrete truck. I'm providing somebody the tool they need to do their job and make their living, and it became personal, and their engagement went up. So I encourage you to do two things. One, scan the horizon of your employees. Who is struggling at the survival level, and, and is there something we can do to help them? So sometimes there's not. Um, what you can always do is help them understand that their tasks connect with the purpose and how that how does that happen? How does sweeping the floor connect with the package getting in the lady's hands in Kokomo with her product. All right, so we're going to move on to the next one. Whoops, wrong way. Sorry. Yep. Okay, Ned. Um, next, I'd like to put up our next poll question. Yep. Um, it is, in which category do you feel that most of your team belong? And as you see, you got five choices there. And while uh, everybody is voting on this we did have a question that come in is once somebody is disengaged is there any way to move them up the chart or are they a lost cause uh, that's that's a great question i'm i'm a big believer is in up first out second so um, i would say that that is um, almost one of those heart-to-heart -heart communications you have to have and let that person tell you are they a lost cause Sometimes employees do get so disengaged that there is no way to bring them back. They're they're completely out. I, I they're mentally checked out. They're physically checked out. Um, they're just not interested anymore. It just doesn't excite them. Uh, it's probably time for them to look for a new opportunity. That opportunity might come within the organization. So uh, you know, to steal from Jim Collins's book, Good to Great, he talks about getting the right people on the bus and then getting them in the right seat on the bus. Everyone on this call has probably had enough experience. We've seen employees struggle in one job and thrive in another um, in the same company. And, and we've seen it go both directions. They were thriving, we moved them and they struggled. They struggled, we moved them and they thrived. So there may be a possibility to move them to a new venue, a new vision, a new view within the organization and get their engagement back up. But I would sit with them and I would make sure they understand what do we ultimately do here. Get it personal. See if that doesn't spark something. And and you know what? Sometimes we're big kids and big and 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 we need to make big decisions. And it's just I'm just not engaged anymore. I need to find a new job. You know what? We'll help you do that. Well, do we have a some poll responses here, Patrick? We do. Awesome. Okay, so. Uh, good. 47% said that uh, you were engaged, employees almost engaged, and then the others are pretty far down. So that's really good to hear. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And I hope um, that those of you that said that can go test your theory, because that's what it is as a theory, unless you're looking at an engagement survey that you have right in front of you that says otherwise, and make sure that you have that right. Uh, make sure that, um, that uh, they are as engaged as you think they are. All right, let's move on to trust. So there's, I wanna ask you to think about trust in a very different way. Um, first, let's talk about trust of consistency. Nobody wants to work with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I want to know that the person next to me, and I don't care if it's my boss, my coworker, or my subordinate, I wanna know that you're consistent. And what I mean by that is that you tackle the problems in generally the same way. I distrust the person that's all over the board, and here's, this is gonna seem odd, 
I distrust the person that's so rigid, they never take into account the variables that we're looking at right now. I, I, I don't think either of those are consistent. I know that sounds in, uh, counterintuitive, but it, but, it, but it really is not. Consistent is I look at a problem, I look at a situation, whether it's a problem or not. I have left and right boundaries due to policies, procedures, regulations, those sorts of things. But within those left, right boundaries, I move left or right until I set on the right course of action and I take it. I also want to know what makes you mad and what makes you happy. I don't want you flying off the handle. I don't want to wonder who am I getting at work today. So that's trust of consistency. Compassion. I need compassion from you in two areas of my life, professional and personal. If I give you a new job and it's, it's new to you, you've never done it before, have a little compassion. Uh, have, make sure they understand there's a learning curve and it's okay to have that learning curve. They're going to stub their toe along the way. We'll figure it out. Per personally, um, I always believe that employees do not come and say, fix my problem. They come to me with their personal problems and say, where can I go get it fixed? So as a friend, a colleague, a subordinate, a peer, or a boss, I want you to be really great referral sources. So go find your employee assistant plan and get very, very comfortable with what it offers and how it works and be able to hand somebody the, the EAP card and say, call this anonymous number. Here, here's a good place. Or maybe there's other referral sources you can give. That's not the only one. It's a darn good one, but it's not the only one. So uh, the other thing I say is, you know, sometimes people just need to take a moment and go to the bathroom and have a cry or collect their emotions or take an extra call because we put mom in the nursing home and the nursing home keeps calling with 47 questions and, and we need to bend a little bit and then they'll bend back our way. So a little compassion goes a long way. Employees want to know what's going on. So communicate to them, communicate to them, communicate to them. We want to know what's happening in our organization. Um, and here's what I believe it comes down to. Your lack of telling me what is going on is more about a feeling of lack of respect for me to tell me than it is a lack of communication. I think it con connects to respect. If you don't tell me, I feel disrespected. Now, most employees won't tell you that, but if we dig deep enough in an interview, they'll, they'll, they'll identify that it's disrespect. It's really interesting. I want to know the people around me are competent to do their job and they do it well. I also want to know this. When they're not competent, they say so. You know what? That's not my area of expertise. It's going to take me a while to learn how to do that. Um, I'll give it my best shot. But what does that take? That other thing called trust. So trust of competency and being able to, to um, uh, admit when I'm not as good at something as maybe you think I am or want me to be and that I need some some runway to, to learn how to do it comes with a just a basic trust that it's going to be okay. Trust of assumption is kind of odd. It's the it's the trust that says, hey, I assume you're going to do a good job, or I assume you're going to pay me on time, or I assume that the the, the job is going to be what it's going to be. We make these all the time, and here's here's what I will tell you. Um, unagreed to expectations are resentments waiting to happen. So make the expectations known, and if you're the leader ask for the expectations. I believe that every boss should ask every employee for you to be successful. What do you need from me? What does that employee need from you as their boss for them to be successful? That is an expectation question. Um, maybe you can't deliver it, but at least you can have the conversation. And then of course, we can't talk about trust without talking about ethics, character, and honesty. Honesty is pretty straightforward. I tell the truth or I don't. Character you know, philosophy classes in college last 12 weeks, and they never really get a full answer on that. The one that I've always liked is, I guess I have two. It's what you do when nobody's watching. That is the, the true measure of your character. And the other one that I like is it's what you do for those who can do nothing for you is a measure of your character. There are certainly others that you hold on to, and I want you to hold on to those. But let's talk about ethics briefly. Um, do you have an ethics statement or core values and do you review them and live them and talk about them in the organization and, and talk about how they're applied on a day-to-day -day basis. If you're not or you don't, you need to go through that exercise because my ethics can be different than your ethics and they're both right. 
until they clash into each other, then we have a problem. That's where we get back up to the assumption. Well, I can't believe they didn't know we don't do that here. Did you lay it out as a value? Did you talk about it as an ethical guiding principle? Nope. Well, then how would they know? Because the last place they came from, that is how they did it. And so to them, it's quite normal. All right. We're going to move on to team accountability. Uh, team accountability, I call it RA squared. Responsibility, authority, and accountability. So here's the, 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 the thing I want you to remember about this. The responsibility is the task. That is what I'm going to do. I'm responsible to do a task. Authority gives me power to direct people and resources, a budget, tools, consumables. I, I can use it at will, whatever it happens to be. And I'm held accountable to a set of standards. This is where this gets very clear to us. See, when I, in the workshop, what I do is I have the uh, the, the participants go through and they have to come up with their own definitions, responsibility, authority, and accountability. Every time I do it, every single time, they get to accountability and they go, well, that's responsibility. And then they get into this loop and they can't get out and they discover, I guess I really don't know. They are three different things. So here's what I really want you to understand. I uh, put it into a visual and the visual is this. The responsibility is the is the stanchion in the middle of the scale. It never moves, it never changes. Take out the trash, just take out the trash. The authority is something that you can give me more of or less than, and accountability, the standards, you can make str more stringent or less stringent. So here's what's to understand about this. This is a very simple explanation. Johnny's old enough to take out the trash. He's gonna get that task. So there's the responsibility. I'm going to give Johnny the authority to go out by the road alone now, because up until now, he wasn't allowed to do that. So he has to have authority in order to get this done. The accountability piece is the measurement piece. On Wednesdays, from the time he gets home from school up until dark, Johnny can get the t trash out into the driveway right-hand side. We now have a standard. We can measure Johnny's success. When you delegate to somebody, these are the three things they need to hear. What I want you to do, what... Um, what uh, the standard looks like, what the success look like, and here's the authority level that you have to get it done. If you give me those things, I'm pretty good. I am pretty good. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we did have another question come in, Ned. Does it matter whether you do the authority or accountability first? It really doesn't. That, and I, that's a, a pretty common question. I, I, I'm not surprised that somebody asked it. So here's what I will tell you. Let's say that I'm going to give uh, the job to John. And uh, John's been with the company a certain amount of time. And I, and, and I, I always say, well, what's the deciding factor here? Well, you know, I don't know that I want to, I don't know John that well. He doesn't know the organization that well. So I want to limit his authority until I kind of see where he is. So I would set the authority first and then I would back in and come in with the accountability piece. What you need to remember is authority and accountability on the scale need to be balanced. If they're a balanced area, if, if they're in balance, pardon me, then they'll be able to hit those accountability standards. If I don't have enough authority, either resources, people, or, or authority to direct, then it's going to be very hard for me to reach, to reach those standards. And if I have too much, and this is, a, this is a, equally as a bad problem, I'm either going to abuse my authority or squander the resource, one or the other. So I always like to have them in balance. If I don't know who I'm going to get it to, uh, then I'll... Uh, pick the task, I'll come up with the standard I want, and then I'll see how I marry that up to the person or if that's going to fit. So it kind of doesn't matter. What you're looking for at the end of the day is balance. Great question. Thank you. So here's your three sentences that I always, just a, a way to, to keep this kind of uh, uh, easy in your mind. I'm responsible for a task. Authority gives me power and resources, and I'm held accountable for a set of standards. So I'm going to give you just um, about 45 seconds to pick one item that you do, just one. Once you write it down, that's your responsibility. That's the task. Then I want you to come over, and again, it doesn't matter which one you answer first or second. Um, maybe the accountability is easiest. It doesn't, it, it doesn't really matter. But I'm going to write down what my authority is to do this and what resources I have. My authority could be I'm the safety manager, and the task could be design a safety program. 
okay, that fits, right? I mean, the, the, so far we're, we're in good shape. And the resources, I have a $3,000 budget to, to explore different programs, uh, go to a conference, buy the program, get the consultant, whatever. The accountability is that I'm going to deliver this program to the boss um, in in 90 days or let's call it 120 days um, and with, with a full workout of how we're going to implement this task in the workplace. I would tell you that that from my small little example here that we're in balance. Now, let's say that I'm going to change I'm going to change it for just a minute. Listen to this. The responsibility is get the accidents in the shop down. I'm the safety manager. Can I do that? Not really. Why? Because I don't have the authority to direct the people in the shop. I can hand them a program, but I can't make them do it. I don't have that authority. I can't write people up. They don't work for me. I can't discipline. I can't go out there and say, you will. Whose job is that? Ah, the plant manager. So you see how this can get twisted quickly, and then we get frustration because a person didn't get the job done because they said, I can't do it. So then I'm going to say, oh, let's make sure the plant manager is held responsible for the task of getting the, the, the accidents down. By the way, there's a different accountability measurement now, how much, by when, right? And he has authority because he is a plant manager and he has a budget and he's he can pull people off the job and do whatever he needs to do or she needs to do. The, the safety manager still has the same responsibility now, going back to the original one, of provide the plant manager with a safety program and uh, a process because they're the safety expert. Now you see where it, where it can become very helpful. So um, if your boss hasn't sat in on this webinar <laughs> and they go, well, Ned, what if my boss doesn't know that and they give me a job and they only give me the job to do, then you have two questions to ask. No problem. Be glad to do the job. What does success look like? What what are you asking for standards? You might not use that word, but, you know, how do I know when I make it to the goal line and you'll be happy, right? And in order to do that, by the way, boss, I need these tools. I need these people. I need this budget. I need whatever. And, and you know, you may end up in a, in a uh, negotiation. Well, that happens. Sometimes we don't get what we want, but at least I've had the conversation and we've worked it out. And that's what's most important. Okay, I think I have one more poll here. Yes, the final poll question, now that you've heard Ned's presentation on high-performing teams, uh, do you feel that you have worked on a high-performing team? Give you about 30 seconds, maybe, maybe 35 seconds to do that. <clears throat> How are we doing there, Patrick? Are they are they getting them in? Good. We've got 86 people. Woohoo! The 14% of you. Oh my gosh! I'm so sorry you've not had that opportunity. Um, <laughs> now, uh, if <laughs> if I'd asked the question differently, I can guarantee you we'd have a very different co poll. If I if I had said have you worked on a low performing team? I would probably say we'd have almost 100%. Most everybody has had the opportunity, and I say that uh, lightly, <laughs> of working in a really pathetic, low performing team with a lot of toxicity, low trust. We don't know what we're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, nobody's accountable. We don't hold ourselves accountable. We don't hold each other accountable. Nobody holds us accountable um, we're, as a group or individually. Um, you know, we, we just, uh, we're not engaged. We could care less. We've, I think probably everybody on this call has had that, has had that um, um, experience. Um, what I will tell you is to work on a high performing team, there's nothing quite like it. It really makes, it makes it great. And it almost doesn't matter what the work is. Um, I've been on some high-performing teams when the work wasn't really very fun, <laughs> um, but uh, it it made it it made it a lot better. Uh, so, um, questions? Any uh, questions that anybody has, Patrick? Do you have a few there? Um, I do have one. They would just like you to repeat. Who is the author of the right seat on the bus? 
Martin Collins. Uh, and the name of the book is From Good to Great is the name of the book. Um, and his name is Jim Collins. Uh, the book's probably coming up on 10 years old now. Um, and I will tell you that uh, the companies that he um, talks about in that book are still pretty high performing companies. Um, and some of the ones that he said were not all that high performing have really fallen on some hard times. So um, his theories are, are well founded. Uh, and it's a great book. And it really talks about um, get the right people on the bus and get them in the right seat on the bus. And I think that is really, really important. Um, the only other thing we have is a comment that is from one of our past participants in one of your programs. And all this person wants to say is is that she wants to say, hi, Ned, and you are the best. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate that very much. Okay, that does conclude our time together. Thank you again for thank you again for joining us. If you would like to learn more about today's topic, we encourage you to register for one of the upcoming programs that will be deliver, delivered on March 14th and April 23rd at the Educational Service Center of Northeast Ohio, lo located in Independence. You can see the registration link on your screen. I do encourage you to register as, since these programs do routinely fill. We, we can also tailor any program and deliver them on site for your team. You can join our extensive list of clients and bring Kent State to your organization. You can contact us at 330-672-3416 or email us at yourtrainingpartner@kent.edu. We also encourage you to register for our next webinar, How Generation Z Will Change the Workplace, with Kent State Facilitator Deborah, Deborah Easton. In that webinar, we will be discussing the differences between Generation Z and the Millennials, how Generation Z will view other generations' groups' mindsets, and how Generation Z will respond to management styles of Gen Generation X and the Millennials. For those of you attending live, you will be asked to complete a short survey. To complete this survey, please, please complete this survey so that we can be assured that we are bringing you the most usable and relevant content possible. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Kent State Center for Corporate and Professional Development and our facilitator, Ned Parks, Thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.